Good morning, everybody. Welcome again. I'm so glad you chose to join us. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday seems to be one of those odd Sundays where it's easy just to skip church and be like, hey, we got to get ready for the party all day. Um, and so I'm glad you said, you know what, this is important enough for me to be here. And to everyone joining online, uh, welcome as well. We're glad you're able to connect with us that way. Uh, we do something every February. We recognize that some of you celebrate Valentine's Day. We also recognize that some of you, like, hate Valentine's Day. Regardless, a February kind of puts us in this mindset of relationships. And so we as a church can either say we're going to ignore that and never talk about it. Or we can say we have the God who wrote the Bible, the whole book about relationships. And if there's anybody who should be able to speak with authority on relationships, it should be the church. And because of that, we say every February we're going to do a series on relationships and just address relationship problems. Some year we do like Hey, we're going to do an entire series just on marriage. Some years we do it on family. Uh, and this year we decided, you know what, let's do like a casserole stew and we're going to do it all. Which means we're either going to be really great and everybody's going to go, wow, that hit me everywhere. Or you're going to be like, that was terrible and I didn't catch any of it, okay? So we're risking it by saying we're going to attempt it all. And this week we're going to throw it all in the pot. And then next week we're going to tighten up and just focus on some specific areas a little better. Uh, but, but what we wanted to do was talk about your relationship with your marriage, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with people who could be friends once were friends but aren't friends anymore and talk about how that works. Anybody got any of those relationships they have in their life? Yeah, a few of us, okay. And so we want to just talk about all relationships today. And, and so if you're in a relationship of any kind, raise your hand and we're speaking to you today. Let me see, make sure everybody got... Okay, a few of you don't have any hands up. I'm very sorry that you think that, okay? You probably are in a relationship. You just don't know it yet, or you're asleep already. All right, so here's uh, what I want you to think about uh, as we talk about relationships. By the way, we always get more uh, Q&A requests during this series than any other series. I think our traffic, like, jumps twofold. And so we, we always take Q&A questions. And uh, one of the cool ones that we got this year was actually about remarriage. Uh, we had a lady write in and she said to me, uh, hey, it's been a several years since my husband died. Uh, this gentleman's asked me to go out on a date. And she said, uh, is, it, is it okay to go out on a date? She said, I feel guilty if I say yes. Wow. Wow. Now, <clears throat> we have a family, our family, that, that actually has some personal involvement in this. When my grandfather passed away, uh, I was only 12. Uh, when he passed away, my grandmother spent several years uh, apart from any relationship. And again, we just watched her be broken and then heal in the midst of that. But I'll never forget the day when she began to hang out with another gentleman who also lost his wife. And after several years, they started to hang out more together. Now, I just got to be, here's, my grandma's like 70 some when this all starts. Okay, and I've lived with my grandmother for like, Two and a half, three years, okay? So we, we, we were tight, and uh, it was great because Grandma always cooked for eight people, and it was the two of us, so I got to eat all I wanted. And uh, we, 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 we got to watch her date. You ever watch old people do stuff that young people should do? It was awesome. It was, it was like awkwardly embarrassing because she would like be nervous about going out. And I'm thinking like, come on, Grandma, when you reach a certain age, don't you just stop being embarrassed? Like, no, but you do. She was embarrassed. She was nervous. She's like, does this look nice? I'm like, I don't know. Like, there are parts of you that aren't where they should be anymore, Grandma. I have no idea. Like, I think it looks good. Yeah, you look great, Grandma. Go for it, right? And, and so Grandma goes out. She's starting to, to date Wayne. And one of my favorite stories is, uh, again, I live there, and I come home late at night. I worked second shift that day. I'll never forget it because I, I didn't normally do that. But I worked second shift, and I came home, and, and I walk in the house, and I holler, hey, I'm home. And I walk past the dining room and into the kitchen. And the kitchen, you can see right over the table, into the hall, into the kind of TV family room. And, and, and Grandma was sitting on the couch, all right, and, and Wayne, as I said, that was doing this, trying to get up. And you know, when you catch two teenagers making out, like they jump to the other side of the couch and they sit there like that, right? And you, I mean, you know what, like, hey, okay, you guys don't, it, you, you missed it. You over-exaggerated your separation. Like, what's going on? When, when you catch two old people making out, they can't move fast, <laughs> right? 
and I watch because it's like a train wreck. You know, you can't look away, and Wayne can't get up. And Grandma's trying to shove him up, right? And she's like, get off. And Wayne's like, I can't move. And I'm watching this, and I, I just, they're so embarrassed like that they've been caught. But they don't, they don't know that I've seen them yet because, again, they're just, they're trying to move still. And, and honest to goodness, this was my thought. Honest to goodness, this is how evil I am. My grandmother had a tendency that every once in a while when she would get excited, she would spit her teeth out. She didn't have all her, it was just the front little area, and she would spit that like a retainer thing out, right? And my only thought was, as I watched this whole thing go down, I go, I don't know, if you're that old and you're making out, do your teeth stay in your mouth? Or does Wayne come up and be like, hey, I think this is yours, right? And how gross is that, right? That was my only thought. And then I, and then I went, you know what, I want to save my grandma some dignity. So I, I, I hollered out, oh, wait, I forgot something out in the car, and I went back out. Again, they haven't seen me. And I took a long time standing outside, like, long time. Like, hopefully by the time I got in there, like, everything was completely okay. And, and I just didn't want to embarrass them, right? And so then I walked in, and it was like two teenagers. They were on the edge of the couches. <laughs> and I'm like, yep, guilty, right? And again, in my head, I'm like, what? You're 70-some years old. If you want to make out, make out. I don't get your house. Do whatever you want, right? And, and, and I just enjoyed watching her be able to enjoy falling in love again. And so my answer, if you're watching online, the lady that, that sent in the question is, you know what, celebrate that. Do not feel guilty. I, I know that my grandfather would have been so excited that my grandmother found someone to spend several years at the end of her life with. And I just, if you ever have a family member that wrestles with that, I just pray that you support them through that moment. And it's hard, because like my dad had to go, he's not taking the place of my dad, I'm, I'm getting someone else to be part of the family. And, and I just, I want to encourage you, if that's a question your family's wrestled with, I just want to celebrate it with you and encourage you to uh, care for your parents in a way that, that honors God through that. But again, that was just one of the questions we had to kick off our relationship series because we always think it should be very practical and helpful. And, and you're ready to go now? All right, we're going to get more of it. <laughs> Again, with our, our stew today, we're going to go to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. And this is, uh, this is a great book. Some of you have it memorized. It takes place during the 8th century, all right, in the middle of the 8th century. Hosea is one of the few prophets that gets to span like seven kings for Israel. And just for those of you who like history, I know most of you don't, so just hold on for those of you who don't, but all right. Israel splits after David's son Solomon passes on and the, the kingdom goes to his son. His son's a terrible ruler and there's a civil war that goes on. And the Israel, as the entire nation splits, there's a northern kingdom which retains the name Israel. And there's a southern kingdom which gets the name Judea. And that's the, the, the lineage of David. And in the history of Israel, you have like three bad kings and finally a king that follows God. And then three bad kings. And you have this whole cycle that goes on of dysfunction of generation after generation, and Israel becomes so corrupt that eventually God says, I'm coming to destroy you as a nation and humble you so that you'll return back to me one day. And so God lets the Assyrians come and they, they conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. And again, we have this huge, wonderful story that ultimately ties all the way into the northern kingdom's capital, Assyria, or excuse me, Samaria. And Samaria, we know, of course, from the Samaritan woman story that Jesus encounters. And so you have all this tension that still exists even in the day of Jesus from the separation and the split of the kingdom. That's just a little history for you. I know several of you were geeked out right there, all right? For the rest of you, here we go, all right? So Hosea is an amazing book. If you like soap operas, anybody like soap operas? Love romance stories? Anybody? Anybody? This is your book of the Bible, okay? You probably didn't know it. This is your book of the Bible. If you sit at home and you're like, oh good, I get to watch a sappy, disgusting movie. This is your book, all right? If you have to wait till your kids go to sleep to watch that show, this is your book. In fact, I wanted to just kind of give a warning, like maybe this is kind of a PG-13 uh, uh, sermon because of the language used in the book, all right? Because in the book, this is the way it works. Hosea is a book where God says, we're going to use your wife as an example, like a, like a prostitute lover who cannot be satisfied with her own husband. And so we have all this language in Scripture about 
what it means to be unfaithful to God and what it means to sin and how all that ties in. And let's just kick into it. Hosea 1, chapter, or excuse me, verse 2. You ready? Hosea, the prophet says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman. I mean, these are things God says on a regular basis. Love your enemies, all right? Care for people, pray. It should be a house of worship. And go marry a promiscuous woman, right? Some of you have had that commandment, right? God told you to do that, right? All right, so again, this is where I thought maybe this was like our pretty woman moment, right? This is like their movie, all right? What's his name, Richard what? Yeah, again, he wasn't that good, but, but Julie Roberts. Now there's somebody hot, right? All right, and so, so everybody knows the movie, right? This was my sister's favorite movie growing up. She watched it like every week. It was crazy. I know every line, all right? And so, and so we have this, this idea that, that, all right, so he's going to go marry a, a, a promiscuous woman. He's going to rescue her. He's going to climb the fire escape. Come on, those of you over 30, you know what I'm talking about, right? He climbs the fire escape, gives her the rose, right? We have this, oh, beautiful love story. This isn't it. All right? So he's got to go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her like an adulterous wife. Now, this is like a little forewarning of the book because if he marries her, she's no longer a prostitute, right? And so there's a little hint as to what's to come in the book. Hint, 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 hint. All right? And it says, because the land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he's basically God's saying, look, I want you to get into a relationship that is a metaphor for how my relationship with Israel, with the people of Israel is. All right? And when God thinks of of how we should be in a relationship with him. He thinks of marriage as the best example, all right? And then he says this. I love this, all right? So he went and married Gomer. Right now, let me just say, if you're Hosea, and you go and you find your wife, and you find out her name is Gomer, all right? You should, like, stop the bus right there and be like, everybody off. This ain't working, okay? All right? Because, look, I don't care... I don't care. There's no way this lady looks good. All right? There's no way this lady's somebody he wants to spend the rest of his life with. Right? She's named Gomer. Right? That's a terrible name. If she was really, like, nice and attractive, she would have had a different name, like Cutie Pie. Right? They would have nicknamed her something else, not left her, like, hung out there to drive with Gomer. Right? So this story's already gone nowhere. Daughter of Diblim. All right? And she conceived and bore a son. Whew. That's the beginning of it, all right? Again, Hosea got the raw end of the stick here. Got to marry a lady named Gomer, right? Can you see this parents like, oh, we're so proud you married a lady named Gomer. Is that even a girl's name? I don't know, all right? Now, just pause because there's some significance behind this, all right? And I want you to see this. I want you to see this because, again, the story ties into so many facets of relationship. We could have done like 10 sermon series off of just chapter 1, 2, and 3 of Hosea. Ready? Watch this. Gomer means, dun, 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 a complication, measure of adultery or ripeness of consummate wickedness. Now, if you're like me, you went, huh? Because I had to read it like six times. It basically means, all right, Gomer means unfaithfulness. Wicked unfaithfulness, okay? So it should be a sign. When you go marry someone and their name is unfaithful wickedness, that's a bad day, right? Right? I like to ride horses. And uh, poor Megan, she's only rode with me like three times. And every time she rides, she has this terrible experience. And I think she's given up on it. All right? But Megan has a rule that she found out the first time she came out and rode. And, and because her horse was named like White Lightning Death. Something like that, right? And what was it? Outlaw. Yeah, there you go. And so Megan's new rule is if the horse is named something dangerous, don't ride it. Right? Because... The name probably is given to that horse for a reason, right? Gomer is named unfaithful wickedness. Now pause. Notice that her father is also mentioned. Here's what I want you to think about. Our relationships, every relationship, not just marriage, not just friendship, not just family, every relationship you have has your history tied into it. Did you know that? That you are unable to divorce yourself from your past. And whatever you've experienced in your past goes immediately into that relationship. Whether it's good or bad. Everything that you've lived through goes immediately into that relationship. <clears throat> and what we call that is family cycles. 
And sometimes those family cycles can be cycles of dysfunction and abuse. Here is Gomer's family cycle. <coughs> this is her father's name. You ready? Her father's name, Biblium, it means double layers of grape cake. Got it? That's terrible, isn't it? Double layers of grape cake. It reminds me like a hostess or a ding dong, right? That's what I'm thinking when I read that. And so then I'm like, oh great, what does that mean? So I had to crawl a little bit further into that, figure out what it means. And it means this. It speaks of one completely giving up to sensuality. Diblim, Gomer's father, was completely given up to sensuality. All right? And then Gomer is named by her father what? One who is promiscuous and wicked. So you kind of go, okay, maybe that was the sensuality he was given him because he named her out of the lifestyle that he was in. Right? Right? And so we read and we sit there and immediately go, hey, this story's not going to go well. Because the very names of the characters suggest that there is massive dysfunction in this family. And Hosea has stepped into it. Now this is huge because in the story, Hosea represents God. And so Hosea intentionally puts himself into relationship with somebody dysfunctional who has a dysfunctional family. And that's huge for me. Because I have a God. If Hosea represents God, I have a God who chooses to enter into a relationship with someone dysfunctional. Hi. My name's Aaron. I got some dysfunctions. Am I the only one or what? Okay, I'm the only one in the room. Excellent. Excellent. The rest of you are perfect. All right, good, good. All right. Come on, we need to claim that, right? I have some dysfunctions. I have a family past the baggage that I bring with me in every relationship. But our God chooses to say, I love you anyways. Now, this is huge because why? Because why? Why, why, why? Because we, every relationship we ever enter into, our first fear is, if you know me, will you still? Thank you. Is that you, Cindy? I knew I could count on you. Everybody over here is asleep already. <laughs> Say it again. If you know me, would you really <clears throat> love me? It's at the core of every one of us, right? <clears throat> and we read the story and go, if Hosea is the God character, Hosea knows full well what he's marrying. God's already given him a preview of the future. And God says, I will be in relationship with you anyways. So the story gets better. You ready? They have three children. Ready? The first son, <clears throat> all right, they name, I will punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Boom. That's a great name for a kid. Some of you that are looking for names for kids, I know we have a couple of you pregnant around here. All right, there you go. All right. The second one, child they have, is a daughter. All right. They named the daughter Lo Ruhuma. All right. I will no longer show love to the house of Israel. What a great name for a girl, right? And then the final son, they named Lo Am I. You are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, talk about a slow message, right? Because it's going to take, what, probably about three years to have three kids at the minimum, right? It may have been longer. So this is a long message, a long metaphor that God says, I want you to be a symbol for my people in your relationship with your wife and your kids of how this relationship with my nation has worked. All right? And so he gives these three kids these terrible names. Why? Well, in part because that's what God calls him to, but in part because we're coming out of a dysfunctional family. And we're trying to figure out how to break the cycles of abuse, of dysfunction, of neglect, of hurt, of pain. All right? Basically, it's this way. God is not pleased by sin, and any sin is likened to adultery in our relationship with God. And the sins of our past separate us from God and separate us from each other and cause dysfunctional breakups. Cause dysfunctional breaks up. All right? Let me give you a couple examples of how that works, okay? Your great-great-grandfather had a drinking problem. Your great-grandfather, therefore, had a drinking problem. Your great-grandfather had a daughter who married someone who had a drinking problem. Why? Because it's the system of dysfunction that she knows how to work in. It's what she goes, this is how dad treats, this is how we survive. And so she has a son who has a 
That's your grandfather now, right? And so they have a daughter, that's you, or a son, that's you. And you have a choice. Do I end this cycle of dysfunction? Or do I marry someone? Or do I myself have a drinking problem? All right? And again, that's the cycle. It keeps repeating after family, after family, after family, after family. And we have to choose, am I going to end the cycle or live into it? Here's a prescripted story of how I can mess up my life. Do I want to go into that or say, there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. There is deliverance through Jesus' name. Now, it doesn't have to be about drinking. It can be about finances. You know, great-great-grandfather, he always couldn't have any money. Great-grandpa didn't have any money. Grandpa didn't have any money. I can choose to say different. I took the Dave Ramsey class at church. I'm going to behave differently with my finances. Okay? It can be about the way you communicate love. You know what? Great-great-grandfather never communicated love, never showed love. Great-grandpa never showed love. Great-grandma never showed love. And again, you can pass that down. All these dysfunctions. You know, we never talked about what? And all these dysfunctions we wrap into our family and we hand down or we choose to break the cycle. Break the cycle. Okay. Now look, all those are a result of sin somewhere along the way. All the cycles of dysfunction are a result of sin because sin is never committed in a vacuum. No matter what we do, when we wrong somebody or something, it's never just us that's affected. It separates us from God, and it separates us from each other. And listen, 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 listen. Unless, unless our wounds are healed, we will always carry the wounds of our past into future relationships. Unless our wounds are healed, we will always carry the wounds of our past into future relationships. This is why someone comes to me and says, I want to get married again. Oh, okay, how many times have you been married? Three. But I can't figure out what's wrong. I know the common denominator in every one of those relationships. Do you want to know what it is? But it's not just marriage. We talk to young people on a regular basis. I can't seem to find the right guy or the right girl or the right guy. I can't seem to, I, I don't know. What am I doing wrong? And I go, well, tell me about how you, how you behave and, and where you're looking. Well, I go to these bars and I'm looking for guys at the bar, and I'm going, oh, that's great. I, I, I go fishing all the time for fish and mud puddles. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to find this great, amazing guy at a bar. It doesn't mean everybody's at bars is evil. It just means that maybe that's not the best place to find someone, right? right? Or, you know, everybody that I hang out with behaves like this, and so every time that I'm with this group of people, I end up behaving like this, and we have this rule in our church. If you're not married, listen to this phrase. Listen to this phrase if you're not married. Are you becoming the person you're looking for is looking for? And what we mean by that is one day you're going to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, and that's going to be the person of your dreams. The question is, have you become the person the person you're looking for is looking for. So when they turn around and look at you, will they go, you're what I've been dreaming about. You see, you may have not met Mr. or Mrs. Wright yet because you're not Mr. or Mrs. Wright for them yet. Come on, give me a mom or dad that says amen there. All right. uh, on the other side, I don't want to leave any of us married out, okay? Those of us that are married, all right, are you becoming the person your spouse has always dreamed of being with? I had to answer that with a, not yet. Right? All right. Now my wife and I, we have our own family dysfunctions. We've identified them and we said we're going to break these. We do not want to live into these. We want to change our story and hand off different dysfunctions to our kids. All right? And that's just us being honest. Like we're not perfect parents, but we're going to not screw up the same way that our stories in the past have messed up. We want to hand off different stories to our kids. Now, here's, here's a couple things, again, because it doesn't necessarily have to be about uh, marriage or dating. Okay, I hear this one. It seems like every friend I have eventually turns their back on me. Really? Now, first of all, again, where are you getting your friends? How are you hanging out with your friends? And maybe that is your story. The other piece I would want to know is, is it really true that every friend you have turns their back on you? Or do you live in such a damaged world that any kind of negativity or accountability is seen as an attack on you? Now again, you see how I bring my baggage in, I go, I'm wounded, I'm, I'm beat up, 
and now I interact with my friends, and any kind of negativity, I go, oh, you've all turned your back on me, everybody hates me, and you isolate yourself from any help you can get. Here's another one. It seems like nobody ever cares about me. Eventually, everybody hates me. All right? Again, maybe you're hanging out with the wrong people. All right? Or is it that your past is such that it's easier to act like Eeyore than to fix and find people to surround you and love you? Again, Eeyore's always upset, right? Is it easier to act like Eeyore or say, we're going to fix this? And let me just pause. This is huge for the church. There are cases where we need counseling. Amen? I don't have to be a total mess to need counseling. I can simply say, I am strong enough to know that I need help, and I'm going to go get help. Amen? So let's all say amen if we know counseling is good for us. All right. Amen. There we go. All right. So we, we, we end the story right now, if we, if we did, and we would have Hosea married to a prostitute who's had three sons, or excuse me, three children, giving them terrible names. Their marriage isn't going to do well. It's a bad story, right? And we get into chapter 2 and we find out that she's left him. And we have this terrible psalm about how she's left and went for a different lover. She's prostituting herself again. And Hosea's left with three kids trying to figure out what to do. And we'd all end it going, what a terrible story. And we'd have a to be continued next week. Because God can fix this, right? We're not going to wait till next week. Let's look at chapter 2. Ready? It says this. Hosea 2.23. It's the end of the psalm. It says, I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. Which child was that? Child number three, third son. It says, I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. Which child was that? That was the daughter. And then it says, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. Now that's the first child. So look, 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 this is the beauty of the story. The Lord God has went and redeemed all three children out of the family dysfunction and renamed them. Now this is huge because if you're like me, you get depressed and you begin to go, God, can you rescue me? And this story reminds you God can not only rescue you but rename you. Amen? It's a story of redemption. It's a story where we look at the cross and go, this was the work of the cross, is that Jesus gave his life for our sins to restore, redeem, and rescue us. And just in case we didn't get fully what was going on, Hosea 3 gives it to us a little more bluntly because I need the bluntness. It says this, The Lord said to me, Go show yourself to your wife again. Remember, his wife left him. Had three kids, ditched him. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Just pause. Practically speaking. Every year we have two or three families that come to us and say, we had an affair, our marriage is destroyed, can God save this? The answer is yes. We have it in Scripture that God can restore marriages that have been broken by an affair. Amen? God can heal anything. 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 Right? So it says, she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. And God says, love her as the Lord loves Israel. Though they turn to other gods. Well, don't we have to wait till she gets right, God? Don't we have to wait till she leaves the other husband? Don't we have to wait till she gets fixed? No, no, you don't have to get, you don't have to get cleaned up to take a bath. Well, don't I have to, like, fix my life and stop smoking and drinking and swearing and doing all this stuff before I give my life to Jesus? Nope, you give your life to Jesus and all that stuff will follow. But don't I have to be perfect before I start coming to church? No, that's not what this is about. We, we, we here are all recovering sinners, right? We're a hospital for sinners. Yeah, but don't I have to? No! The Lord God is going to go love you and rescue you while you are still committing adultery. And that's what Hosea does. That's what he does. He goes on and says this. So I brought her for 15 shekels. How awesome is this story, right? First of all, Hosea is just having a rough day, all right? He's got three kids. And now he's got to go to a pimp to buy his own wife back. All right, are you catching that? That's what's going on in the story. He's got to go pay a pimp. 
someone because his wife is in slavery to another man. He's got to go pay to buy his own wife back. What's it a metaphor of? The relationship with God and his people, right? This is why Paul uses language when Jesus is on the cross describing the sacrifice. He says that Jesus paid his life as a ransom. A ransom for our lives that we would no longer be slaves in sin. That Jesus gave his life as a payment to buy us back. And it says he dresses his bride in pure spotless white. It says he ransomed, he bought her back for 15 shekels of silver, about a homer and a lekith of barley. I have no idea what that means or how much that is, right? It says, then I told her, listen to the marriage covenant. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days and not be a prostitute or intimate with any man. First of all, if that's in your marriage vows, your marriage is in trouble, okay? But that's what's in these marriage vows. Don't be a prostitute anymore. Okay, I got it, all right? All right? And he says, and then he says this, and I will behave the same way towards you. I know that when we gather, we gather and we all walk in with different brokenness and different hurts and different just challenges in life and many of us walk in feeling beat up every week and many of us walk in going God can you love me this week is your love big enough to overcome all that I've been through all that I've done all the mistakes that I make God is your love big enough this is why I love the story of Hosea and Gomer it's because there is no price that God did not pay he went to the cross to say I will buy you back Yeah, but God, I don't have any value. God says, you don't have any value. The price I paid for you was a cross. They stamped it on the back of your head, scanned it at the Kroger register, and said, this is the price. And I went to the cross to pay for you, to win you back while you still hated me. When you begin to go, I have no value, when you begin to go, God, can you still love me? Read the story of Hosea over and over again and over again and know that our God is for you all right one more point you ready because I wanted to end it there and then uh, about Friday uh, God began to speak to me and I couldn't end it there okay so uh, here's where I I wanted to say okay yeah God redeems us but there's another piece to that this way right and we read in Mark 25, one of the most scary verses in all the Bible. It says this. When, you're, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. And basically what it's saying is that if you, all right, go to God and say, forgive me. God says, yep, I, I, I got that. But then you walk away to your neighbor and say, I won't forgive you for what you've done to me. Basically, God says, then I'm not going to forgive you anymore. Wow. Isn't that a little intimidating? Because I like to live with a little anger, right? I struggle with forgiveness. Do you struggle with forgiveness? And come on, ladies, 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 right? You still upset with someone in third grade, right? She stole your dolly, called you a name, and cut in front of you in a water line. I can't even remember third grade, but you ladies, you remember the name, you remember what she looked like, and you still stalk her on Facebook and send her nasty stuff, right? See, guys, we're not smart enough to harbor anger that long, right? We just can't do it. I had a high school teacher, I'll never forget this. He said, you know, with guys, you could put boxing gloves on and say, let's go out and finish it right now. And they would go out in the parking lot, beat each other to death. Three hours later, they would hug and talk about what a great fight that was. And they would be friends. Not ladies, right? You remember that. You just, again, you're smarter than we are, but you, the dysfunction of being smarter is that you, you can hold on to that. So I had good news this week. I don't know if you, you caught our good news, uh, but Friday an investigator came out to my house finally, and, uh, or, excuse me, I met them here at the police station, and uh, we spent about an hour talking, and at the end of that hour, uh, the investigator said, hey, basically, like, this was parents who didn't want you to coach anymore. This is what this is about. And she said this was 
I'm sorry, this has kind of been tough on your life. Uh, we're done. She said, I've got to file this officially. I've got to go back and type it up. And on Monday or Tuesday, this part will be over. Amen? All right? And uh, I said to her, like, so do you know, like, with children's services, how this works? Do we put our family back together? Or how does that work? She goes, I don't, I don't have any hands in that. I don't touch it. I'm just investigating. And she said, this is done. Uh, we'll close the case, and you haven't done anything wrong. And I went, do tell, right? <laughs> like, okay, yeah. And, and, and here's what I was wrestling with then, because I've been on this journey, like, how do I live not letting anger have root in my heart? How do I not let my heart be hardened? Because I know that if I let this situation, this terrible situation that we've gone through, infect our hearts and make us angry, there's always going to be part of my heart that I can't give away that's whole. And I've let evil in, and they've won, and they've created a spot in my heart that God doesn't own, and I don't want that. And so I want to know, God, in the midst of someone doing the worst thing imaginable to us, how do I learn to forgive? And I want to say to God, like, I just want to hold my anger, just be angry. And then I read, well, you see, Aaron, has anybody ever done anything worse to you than you've done to me? Has anybody committed adultery with you? And even if that, then I went and bought them back. And Aaron, when you come to my cross, I forgive you. And if you turn around and say to someone, what you did to me was worse than what I've done to God, and you won't forgive them, I won't forgive you. Dang it. Right? Because I like being angry. It makes me feel good. But I want God to own my whole heart. And I don't want that place in my heart to ever be a cancer to anybody here or to my marriage, or to my kids. I want to say to God, this heart is broken and given to you. Now, in fairness, we've done some counseling already, and I don't know that I'm all the way there. Because sometimes when you're hurt really bad, forgiveness is a journey, not an overnight experience. And so this is kind of my closing thought to you. You know, we have this beautiful story of family dysfunction, and God heals the family dysfunction. We have this beautiful story of idolatry and unfaithfulness, and God says, I will redeem the unfaithfulness. And at the end of the story, we have this beautiful reminder that, look, God healed this, you go heal this. So let me just leave you with a couple thoughts. Is there someone that you need to forgive? I mean, is there someone right now that you're like, I am getting ready to leave if you keep talking about forgiveness because I hate you right now and I'm so angry I don't even want to hear you talking about it. Right? Again, if you feel that in you, you've let that, 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 that spot in your heart grow and grow and grow and God says you don't have to live with that anger. Bring it to me. And we may need counseling. We may need help. What are your family past stories that you look at and go, we're not going to live that way. We're going to break that cycle and behave differently as we move forward. And who is it that you've surrounded yourself with that will push you into moving closer to God? This is one of the beauties of our small groups here at church. Because you should be with a group of people that keep calling you into health. One of the reasons why I think Gomer ends up back as a prostitute is because she doesn't isolate herself from those old friends and old relationships. And so when you have three kids and life gets tough, she goes back to what she always knew. Who is it that's pushing you towards God, not pulling you away? I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray that you go home, that you go out to eat, that you go wherever you go, and that you go, boy, there was a lot he talked about, but I need, to, I need to work through some of this with you. Can we talk about it? Hey, what are some of our family dysfunctions? Hey, is there any place where you still hold anger and grudges that God is saying, forgive or I won't forgive you? We pray with me? Lord Jesus,
Help us to forgive others because that's, that's the example you've given us. That's who you are. So, Father, may we behave more like you in all that we do. Lord Jesus, help us to, to claim our identity as those who've been purchased by you, redeemed by you, and sanctified by you for your glory and your glory alone. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the hero of our story. In Jesus' name we pray. We gave a lot to you today to kind of push you into some critical thinking about relationships. Go do it now. Go invest in relationships and ask the difficult questions and examine yourself in the mirror and go, is there anybody I need to forgive? Is there a place where I need to say to God, I'm valued and I just haven't embraced that. May you enter into February with us and go, I'm going to do relationships different this year. In the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, you are blessed. Go forth and live as those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name.